My name is Jake Baxter. It's been a year since the world as I knew it blew up in my face, although I suppose it's wrong to say that. The world didn't blow up on its own. I blew it up. I destroyed it around me and walked away from the destruction. To speak my honor, I had some help in doing so. At least 60 rogues were paid in full. I only lit the fuse. My wife was one such cheater, and I took perverse pleasure in destroying everyone with her. Until my great awakening, I was a happy, unsuspecting husband, in love with my wife and delighted with our life together. Everything was going great. We had been married almost five years, and we had our own little house with good friends and neighbors I liked, great jobs and supportive families. We made more money than we needed to live on, and saved for a future that turned out to be very different than we had planned. I wish I could tell you something about us or our marriage that could make sense of this story, but the truth is, I can't make sense of it myself. I married my college sweetheart. She was sweet and kind and funny. She was loving and affectionate. She wasn't the type to flirt with other men all the time. She didn't dress provocatively, and I never doubted that she was faithful to me. I work in a research and engineering lab that develops highly specialized electronics for NASA and the military. We jokingly call it Geek Central. The peculiar thing about most geeks is that we do very complex things at work, but at home we are quite simple. What you see is what we are. There are no tricks because we're not good at it. A lot of people think prodigies are teenagers. Maybe by their standards, they are. We laugh at silly jokes, quote movies and obscure works, and are fascinated by the details of existence. Whatever sophistication we possess is not appreciated in social circles. On the other hand, we know that if we lose our reputation for telling the truth, we're finished. Geeks don't lie. Our reputation is our career, and both are built on the truth. My wife Jeannie works in high finance at a firm called Watson. They are big players in the financial side of large construction projects and seem to have a hand in many of the largest construction projects in the mid-Atlantic states. The office is downtown, and Jeannie works with a lot of surprisingly uneducated people. They understand money, and some of them can program a spreadsheet. But I confess that every time I talk to her co-workers, I feel like I'm back in high school. It's pure truth. Jeannie and I had two kittens. They were brothers. We wanted to name them Lewis and Clark. One of her co-workers very seriously said, That's not bad, but you really should name them after someone famous. You know what I mean? They're the cool kids, and I'm invisible. Jeannie and her co-workers always work through all the options. And if it's not written down, it means nothing to them. I never liked it, but I always thought it was her job, but not her values. God, how wrong I was. Where geeks think individually and come together to test their ideas, financiers think collectively. They identify with the group. The only time they think as individuals is when they are looking for the next rung and trying to move up the ladder. I didn't like many of them, but I didn't really hate them until the very end. The first unpleasant feeling I had was at the Watson Christmas party. It was held at the Marriott Hotel across the street from my wife's office. Everyone was chatting freely, and half the time I didn't know whether I was talking to a co-worker or their spouse. Drinks were flowing, and one day by chance, standing the bar, I overheard a woman say to another, I have to walk past my work husband before I can do that. That was strange to hear. I wanted to turn around and see who was saying it, but instead I froze. A quiet voice in my head said, Stop. Listen, don't say anything. Try to become invisible for just a moment. Well, we're all going on vacation for the next week, but I don't think it'll last until then. You know it's a whole week without crossing the street. Both women laughed. You can always have a little emergency with an account at work. That made them both laugh even harder. What did she mean by crossing the street? Did they think they would have to go back to work in the middle of the Christmas party or later? I didn't understand what I heard, but it bothered me. I remember thinking, boy, did I really marry the right woman. Whatever they think, it doesn't sound good. Then I let myself forget about it and went back to the party. I didn't think about it again for about the next three weeks. Friday night, I was coming up the carpeted stairs from our basement when I heard my wife say, okay, I'll get right on that. Hey. What's a wife for anyway? Then she laughed. A wife? What the hell is that? I rounded the corner just as Jeannie was hanging up the phone. What could this all mean? I asked. I did my best to say it without a hint of accusation. She nearly jumped in her seat. I surprised her. 
Oh, that was Henry Thomas. It's for work. Three tomorrow I need to get to the office, and next week we'll be working late. An opportunity came up to put together a financing package for the new apartment complex they're trying to build on J Street. I was reminded of the conversation I overheard at the Christmas party. 3VY is like a little emergency co-account, I said. Jeannie laughed. Huh, I don't know if I'd call it an emergency, but it's too good an opportunity to pass up. We've both worked hard this year. I was hoping we could relax a little this month and spend more time together. Honey, don't be such a drag. You have to grab onto these things when they present themselves or you'll lose them forever. I'll make it up to you. And what's all this talk about wife? I thought you were my wife. How many husbands have you had? A flash of shock flashed across her face. She didn't know I'd heard her. She tried to hide it behind a hasty smile. Just you, silly. That's how we talk in the office. We team up to work on projects and sometimes joke that we see more of our work partners than we see of our husbands and wives at home. It's just our little joke. That's what they say. Jeannie spoke confidently to the point of condescension. She was smiling, but her hands were shaking. I'll just come by tomorrow for a few hours to unwind the case, and then we'll spend the rest of the weekend together. The rest of Friday night passed quietly, and Jeannie left for the office Saturday morning as if it were a normal work day, except for the casual attire. The rest of the weekend together didn't start until after 7 p.m. Saturday night. Don't get me wrong. I understand hard work and deadlines. I just don't like marital secrecy and I felt there was a lot more mystery in my marriage than I suspected. That Saturday, I thought a lot about secrecy as I waited for Jeannie to come home. Even though I always told her stories about work or stories I had heard at work, I began to realize that she never told me about her work. It was as if she had two lives, one at work and one at home. I had never realized before how much she had shut me out of that part of her life. When my wife finally came home Saturday night, she went straight to the shower and I grilled steaks. I couldn't stop thinking about that remark in the phone call. Wife. Even if it was innocent, it made me cringe. I didn't like it one bit. Two phrases from that Christmas party kept echoing in my head. One was working husband and the other was crossing the street. Was it literal or figurative? There were two buildings across the street from Jeannie's office. One was a large medical clinic. The other was a Marriott hotel. It struck me that many of the people at that Christmas party seemed surprisingly well-versed in this hotel. I kept telling myself that they probably went there for lunch and housed visiting clients, but in my disgusted mood, I kept envisioning a different scenario. The following week, I decided that I needed to get out of the lab and have lunch in my car. In the process of lunch, my car happened to be parked a block up the street from where my wife worked, and I just happened to have a great view of the street between her office and the Marriott Hotel. What I saw, I didn't like. At about 11.45 Monday morning, just before lunch, about a half dozen couples, a man and a woman, crossed the street and entered the Marriott Hotel. At about 12.30, I could see the same couples returning to their offices. There were no groups of three or four women getting together for lunch just couples. I didn't see my wife among them, but I wasn't happy. I saw the same thing on Tuesday, different couples, but the same behavior. I knew I couldn't walk into the Marriott and watch the lobby. Too many people would recognize me, not least my wife if she saw me there. I needed help. Never in my wildest dreams or nightmares did I think I would do what I did next. That same day, I hired a private investigator named Harvey Madison. I told him what I knew and what I needed to know, and then I gave him a picture of my genie. He told me to do the most impossible thing imaginable. He said, don't think about it. Just go back to your life and act normal. It probably doesn't mean anything. And if it's something so unpleasant, you'll soon find out. I told him I really hoped I was wasting my money and went back to work. I had not wasted my money. Thursday morning, Harvey met me in his office to give me the bad news. My wife walked into the lobby of the Marriott Hotel on Wednesday morning at 11.45, Henry Thomas's arm around her waist. They lingered at the front desk just long enough to get a key and went straight up to the fourth floor. They made it back again at almost 12.40. Harvey Madison had a brief and very confidential conversation with the receptionist. My wife and her work husband were regular visitors to the hotel. Harvey's conversation at the front desk cost me $300, and Harvey warned me that this was just a down payment. 
I needed ironclad proof, and that meant videotaping from inside the room. I hated myself for what I was thinking, but my thoughts about my wife were getting downright grim very quickly. To get what I wanted, the porter had to cooperate with us. Harvey needed to know which room Jeannie and her work husband would be using. The porter would then book the same room immediately before and immediately after their next visit, allowing Harvey to set up a small video camera in the room. This meant paying rent and a bribe. I could afford it, so I paid it. I had a bad seven days. I tried to avoid Jeannie as much as possible, but she asked me why I was acting so weird. I just told her it was because of work, but I doubt I fooled her. She wanted to make love, and I told myself that if I hadn't caught anything STDs yet, I probably wouldn't, so we did. My heart wasn't in it. My buddy was barely hanging on. My only emotions were anger and pain. I felt like my marriage was dying, but I still had very little evidence with no explanation. I knew she was cheating, but I tried to convince myself not to judge definitively until we had video from the room. I had to see it to be absolutely sure. Harvey called the porter and he booked the right room for the following Wednesday morning and evening. I arrived at Harvey's office on Thursday morning. I now had proof and the accompanying heartbreak. I watched a 40-minute video of my loving wife, the center of my universe, having sex with her work husband, Henry Thomas. The world as I knew it had come to an end. The mind of a geek sometimes goes in strange directions. I'm reminded of the old anecdote about the husband who comes home and discovers his wife is cheating on him. He puts a gun to his head and says to his wife, Don't laugh! You're next! I promised myself I'd do it in the proper order. They'd pay and I'd leave satisfied. But before that, I needed to get away for a few days. I couldn't be in the same house with Jeannie. I talked to my boss and arranged to take the rest of the week off. If anyone asks, I was needed in wallops all weekend. I went home, packed a bag, left a note, and headed west. I had a childhood friend, David, who lived about an hour outside of Baltimore, and he agreed to host me for the weekend. I counted my blessings that our paths with Jeannie didn't cross while I was home. I don't know what I would have done, but I was in no shape to act normal. I needed time to think, plan, and most importantly, calm down. Leaving that note was the first time I lied to my wife. I actually felt bad about it, but I needed to leave and I wasn't going to let up. The trip west gave me some time to think. Did I really know this woman? Was she so good at compartmentalizing her life that she could rationalize having two husbands? One thing I knew for sure, my wife had mistaken gullibility for stupidity. I had never been stupid, and lying to a husband who trusts you completely is not a clever trick at all. Now the days of trust were behind me. My marriage was dead and all that was left was a funeral. What's special about childhood friends is that they know you completely. They knew who you were then, who you are now, and what you think about all the time. You can't hide from them. My friend read everything on my face not two minutes after I crossed the threshold of his house. I told him the news, and as good friends should, he was as angry as I was. Then there was his wife, Marie, who tried to calm us both down and make us think. She was in no way defending Jeannie. She just wanted me to know exactly what I wanted and not go half crazy. Make no mistake, we need a woman's perspective to truly understand what's going on. Where I was angry at my wife and her working husband, her focus was on all the other women who worked in that office. In her opinion, it was the women who controlled sex, and every woman there either participated in it through their behavior or turned a blind eye to it. She said, men are pigs, and it is the job of women to civilize them. Then she smiled at her husband, who reluctantly agreed. I want to destroy them all. I am divorcing my wife, that lying, cheating whore. She betrayed me, and obviously not for the first time, but I want to hurt them all. I want to make her Mr. Henry Thomas wish he'd never been born, and I want every crook in this office to regret every day they cross the street to the hotel. Marie tried to admonish me. Make sure you're prepared for the consequences. There could be a reason for what happened that you don't know about. She may regret her actions so much that she'll never do it again. You love this woman enough to marry her. Do you want to throw it all away now? Think about it. I pulled out the flash drive with the video, and they watched it with me. Henry Thomas was a paper salesman. His job involved money. Where I ran after work, he went to expensive restaurants. Henry Thomas was a softie. For 40 minutes, we watched my wife give herself to her working husband. She acted like she was in a porno movie. 
The strange thing was that most of the conversation centered on work. As they undressed, they talked about the current project, and later, as they dressed, they discussed the schedule for the afternoon. Once he recovered from the quick first round, she took him for a second time as a rider. She bounced around like a little girl on a beach ball and squealed just as loudly. The video captured the look of ecstasy on his face as he finished. They never once used condoms. When the video ended, there was silence in the room. I turned to Marie and asked, how long do I have to think about this? She just shook her head, gave me a hug, and left to make dinner. My friend David became a lawyer when he grew up. His wife teaches middle school science. Both have amazing analytical minds. We talked a lot that weekend, and with their help, I formulated a plan. I called Harvey and told him exactly what I wanted. It was going to cost me a lot, but if I was patient, it wasn't hard to accomplish. We decided to divide my wife's office into two groups. There was the management team and those who worked closely with Jeannie. It was one group of about 10 people plus their work spouses. I wanted them to be more than just burned. I wanted them turned to ashes. The others would feel the heat, but I wouldn't waste my money on burning them. Harvey installed video cameras in the suites of the management and employees he was targeting. The others would be videotaped as they entered and exited through the hotel lobby. When I was ready to file divorce papers, I would simultaneously sue the company and share what I had with the spouses of each of its employees. I spent a lot of time that weekend wondering if I had missed the signs. There had to be some signs. She never seemed unloving. She was supportive when I described the difficulties at my job. Could she really have lived two lives without guilt? Was she a sociopath? Her nervous reaction when I asked about the wife remark that first Friday told me that she distinguished right from wrong, or at least knew that her actions could have consequences. I couldn't understand how someone could go two lifetimes without having a nervous breakdown. Sometime over the weekend, it occurred to me that by leaving town, I had given Jeannie and her work husband the perfect opportunity to use our house for a date night. I thought about it, got angry, and then realized it didn't matter one bit. I was divorcing her regardless of her actions now. I'd keep her damn bed just in case, and I'd take what I wanted out of the rest. I prepared myself for the action ahead and drove home Sunday night. To save some money, we decided not to videotape any of the working spouses in their hotel rooms more than once. The exception would be my wife and her Mr. Thomas. This would cut down on the cost of booking rooms, and it would only amount to two hours a day for Harvey's people. As for Jeannie, I wanted to quash any claims that it was just a one-time thing. It only took two weeks to get everything I wanted. I hated those weeks. I know some will say, wasn't one time enough? Of course it was, but I wanted revenge on the whole office, on everyone who knew my wife was cheating and didn't say anything to me, and it took a little longer. Most working spouses seem to slip away once a week. Some cross the street more often, and some perhaps less often. We didn't catch them all, but enough for my plans. Jeannie and her work husband stuck to the every Wednesday schedule. I decided to work late often, but it wasn't enough. It was too painful to be at home. I organized another emergency trip to Wallops on Thursday, but I actually stayed at a hotel near work that night. Friday night, I drove west to visit David and Marie again, and then stayed at the hotel again on Monday night. Jeannie started complaining that I was ignoring her, and at least on my part, the relationship grew cold. She had no idea how frosty it was. For whatever reason, she tried to maintain a normal relationship at home, but I was of little use, and it started to show in her general behavior. I started sleeping in the guest room and leaving the house early. I may have had my own deadlines at work, too. Maybe she thought our marriage was in trouble, or maybe she bought my excuses, or maybe she just didn't care. Either way, it didn't stop her from having lunch on Wednesdays with her work husband. At any rate, their lunch breaks got longer. And as I learned, at least two-thirds of her company's employees cheated on their spouses, including most of the senior staff. I guess it's true what they say about fish rotting from the head. Months later, I realized that in the three videos I saw, they never once mentioned me. It didn't slander me. She didn't mention me at all. She didn't complain about me or need my protection. She wore her wedding rings, which made me even more angry, but it was as if I didn't exist. I was simply not considered in this part of her life. There was a sexual tenderness between the two partners, 
but in a strange way, there was no real intimacy. They were more than sex buddies, but less than lovers. I thought my marriage was over that first Wednesday when I watched my wife walk through the lobby, put her arm around her working husband's waist, and walk up to their room. After watching them fuck, I realized there would be no discussion, no excuses, and no cliches. I was ready to destroy my marriage and her entire office with her. I didn't want to hear her apologize, and I didn't want to see her cry. I sure as hell didn't want to hear that it was just sex. Three dates, four, actually, would have silenced any claims that she only loved me. My attorney prepared the legal documents, and Harvey prepared everything else. At 10 o'clock Monday morning, a special man entered the Watson office to serve Jeannie and Henry Thomas at their desks. He then entered the CEO's office and served the company. It seems almost ironic now, but the CEO of Watson was George Walker, and he was one of the crooks. George Walker was 67 years old and had a trophy wife who was only 29. Why would he want to molest a 45-year-old secretary? I'll never understand some people. My cell phone rang at 10.20 and I turned it off. Once the start was made, five Harvey operatives began delivering heavy paper envelopes to the real spouses of each company employee. Some had photographs, some had videotapes, and all received detailed reports that could be used in divorce proceedings. Henry Thomas's wife received a particularly large envelope. Others simply received letters informing them of what was going on at the Watson office in case they wanted to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with their spouses when they got home. They all received a short note that said, In the interest of full disclosure, you can thank Jeannie Baxter for bringing this to our attention. I wondered how many friends my cheating wife would have on Tuesday morning. Watson disappeared almost overnight. My lawsuit against the company was followed by at least 20 more. Divorces spread through the office like a firestorm. Even some marriages where we never found evidence of adultery didn't survive. Management tried to fire anyone who was tainted by scandal, only to be confronted with their own involvement in the mess. Those who were innocent left almost as quickly, hoping to preserve their own reputations. The press got wind of the debacle, and two weeks later there was an article about the firm that included the phrase, working spouses. I wonder where they got that. I bet it was just some crazy husband who didn't understand how the real world works. Shortly thereafter, business ceased and the office closed within two months. The office building sat empty for almost a year. Eventually, I did meet Jeannie at my attorney's office. She cried a lot. After weeks of angry messages mixed with denials, pleading, and bizarre attempts at bribery and negotiation, she finally took some responsibility for her situation. She said she immersed herself in the excitement and culture of high finance. I don't know what sex with her co-worker had to do with finance, but it was definitely part of the culture. The apology didn't last very long, and eventually she said it was partly my fault for not discussing my concerns with her. Yeah, turns out, it was my fault. Bullshit. You shouldn't have to remind your spouse not to fuck her work husband. More importantly, you shouldn't have to remind your spouse not to have a goddamn work husband at all. I never really understood Jeannie's infidelity, and she never adequately explained it to me. All I know is that she had changed. A clear-eyed and seemingly truthful girl interested in business had turned into a two-faced and supremely deceitful liar who seemed to live by the motto, If he doesn't know, it won't hurt me. Harvey told me that they only got together on Wednesdays during lunch. They didn't use my absence from home that weekend as an opportunity to get together. She seemed to have some strange sense of a double marriage that limited her cheating but didn't eliminate it. Harvey tried to explain to me that he thought it was some kind of perverse bonding ritual. Watson had a depraved corporate culture where building a team meant fucking your co-workers. There was even some kind of perverse fidelity at play, where employees only had sex with one person, and it was usually the person they worked most closely with. Harvey thought they believed they were simply smarter and superior to everyone else. Whether it was a shared secret that led to the risks they shared together, or a warped social contract, I never understood. I wish I could say I stopped understanding either, but I never stopped caring about my marriage to Jeannie or the circumstances that led to my divorce from her. I could have spent my life trying to understand these people, or I could have just walked away. I chose the latter. I got my revenge, but it didn't quite work out the way I planned. I won my lawsuits, but the company's accounts were empty, 
and Henry Thomas had lost almost everything in the divorce. My own actions made the company and Thomas unable to pay the lawsuits against them. How's that for irony? My wife lost her job and was demanding alimony when I divorced her. My attorney argued that her unemployment was a direct result of her infidelity, which led to the divorce and she did not get alimony. Even the abusive cheating spouses resented me for ruining their lives with an unpleasant truth. They seemed to blame me almost as much as their cheating spouses. It's a big city. I can live without their love, but I didn't see this coming. One injured spouse surprised me more than the others. Sheila Thomas approached me at the bar one night. She was amazingly attractive, and that should have been more than enough for any man. I was still drinking my first beer. She introduced herself, sat down next to me, and put her hand on my crotch. Well, she had my attention. I'm divorcing my husband, but I want revenge even more. I want to tell him that I slept with his whore's husband. Will you help me do that, Mr. Baxter? How about it, Jake? Will you defile me and help me humiliate the man who fucked your wife? I wasn't sure what I thought of the word humiliate, but I decided I would help her, and I did what I could, and I did just that until late at night. I told you I slept in the guest room for two weeks before servicing my wife, so I was due some compensation. I finished five times that night. I felt dehydrated and needed to drink water every hour. When leaving early the next morning, Sheila said she was heading home to rub it on her husband's face. I reminded her that I had rubbed it on my face with it earlier in the night, and I would love to rub it on my face again. She laughed and promised that I would do it soon. Jeannie's family was furious and mad at me for a while, so I sat them down and showed them the video. They cried, apologized, and cried again, but not much anymore. In the end, they didn't hold me responsible for the divorce, even though they tried to convince me to give her a second chance. I couldn't. There was no forgiveness in me, and for the life of me, I couldn't remember her asking me to forgive her. She turned my heart to stone, and it stayed that way for over a year. At some point during the divorce, as I was telling my friends at work about what had happened, it occurred to me that all my skills came to naught when I needed to catch my cheating wife. I'm an expert in high-tech electronics, but she was caught while eating a sandwich in a parked car, a bribe to the porter, and some miniature video cameras you can buy online. I also thought about how easy it was to catch them and how easily they could hide it. I overheard two conversations, and it worked. Everything was out in the open. The couples crossing the street didn't even try to hide their involvement in cheating. What arrogance. As they say in the suburbs, what would the neighbors think? I mean, people should have known. It's almost a miracle they got away with it for so long. I began to wonder, did the world I lived in bear any resemblance to the world around me? Did everyone did? Where I worked, anyone who called themselves a player was unmarried and only dated their right-hand man. So I realized I was sitting at the geek table again, trying to understand the cool kids. I do see Jeannie on the streets or in stores from time to time. I don't stop to talk to her, and I don't know what she's doing. When she sees me, she looks like she wants to cry. I never look at her for long. The sight of her still breaks my heart. I turn away, and she knows better than to come near me. I am no longer the man she married. The life I knew is gone, and I'm starting over. Like I said, I lit the fuse and blew it. Little did I realize that the shrapnel would tear my own heart to pieces.